Welcome back to another episode of the CSK8 podcast. My name is Jared O'Leary. Each week of this podcast is usually an interview with a guest or multiple guests or a solo episode where I unpack scholarship in relation to computer science education. For the last couple of years, the week after National Suicide Prevention Week, I've shared a supercut of guests responding to a question around how to prevent burnout. I'm sharing this because I fully understand how difficult it is to be in education or an educator. And so I want to share ideas from many of the wonderful guests that we've had on the show, so that way you too can hopefully learn how to prevent burnout and hopefully stay in the field. Because if you listen to the episode that I released a couple weeks ago where I kind of talk about some of my concerns about the future of the field, I'm genuinely concerned. So I hope this episode is helpful for you. And know that in the show notes at jaredoleary.com, you'll find links to each one of these episodes so that way you can actually listen to the full episode, as well as a bunch of computer science education resources, and then even a bunch of gaming and drumming stuff if you're into that too. While you're there, you'll notice that this podcast is powered by Boot Up Professional Development, which is the nonprofit that I work for. Check out bootuppd.org if you want to see the free curriculum that I create or learn more about the paid professional development. All right, so the first clip that we're going to listen to is from Laura Desenza. This is from episode 102. Definitely making sure I take time to do my passions as well. So on top of teaching, I'm also a high school basketball and volleyball coach. So having that time that's almost scheduled from August all the way through March. That's, you know, I've got at least two and a half hours a day in the gym with the high school kids and playing with them and coaching them and focusing on that. And then I'm a crafter too. So making sure, you know, I know maybe I'm doing this project for the kids, but let's have some fun and do it for myself. So taking that time away, but also knowing that I am prepared. We've been through worse. It's going to be okay. So let's just see what we've done and what we can make better or adjust for whatever situation we're in. So, you know, we're in person full-time. Great. You know, I can use the 3d printer that's in my classroom or I can use, you know, the doodle pens, you know, we're remote now. Well, maybe we get cardboard and we try to make our own 3d structure out of it. It's going to be okay. The kids are still learning the concepts and the ideas I want them to learn. It's just in a different forum. All right. Now the next clip is from Liam and Delizer. This is from episode 104. It helps to be an internal optimist. I joke that I'm a glass a quarter full kind of girl. I often surprise taxi drivers when I got off of airplanes because they're expecting like grumpy travel passenger. And I'm like, it's a great day. And they're like, what? Why? Huh? And I'm like, it is highly improbable that any day will be the worst day of your life. You only get one of those, but you get a whole lot of days. And so every day holds promise. And while I recognize that in the current place I am in my life, there's a lot of privilege to support that. Growing up, I was a foster child for a short while. And that has really grounded in me to take the things around me that are good, the progress that we make every day and value it. That doesn't mean you don't strive harder to keep making change, but it does mean you value the small things and the small wins along the way. And I think that is forward of who I am as an individual. And I also need to credit a little bit of my house crew. So for those of you who know me on social media, you may have seen at the last SIGC and the last CSTA, I found places where I could go with Maya Israel and Diane Levitt, who are both not only academic colleagues, but good friends. And we literally retreated to a house together. Because when you're listening in isolation to that stew of community that you've talked about, those negative messages, when you don't have anybody around you to unpack them can be dangerous. And so how do we find not only our allies, but also the folks that you can be vulnerable with? How do you say like, I didn't understand that to someone who's not going to judge you for it, talk through it, be able to say like, I don't have the right language around this yet, but I am thinking about this from this way. Over the last year, I've developed a lot of worked really hard to try and develop improvement in my own language about how I refer to Black, Indigenous, and Hispanic people, how to be more thoughtful in the way that I engage other audiences and people whose life experiences is different from my own. I'm not there yet. I'm still working on it, but it's really, really helpful to me to have someone who I trust where I can try things and they'll tell me like, no, we don't want to go. That's not right. (laughs) And at the same time, to wander in that space together, to think through, like, what are our goals for the world? And how do we get there? Or maybe that's not the right particular compass direction anymore. And we have to go one degree to the left. But having those sounding boards who understand enough about your professional domain, not just your personal one, that you can live in that camaraderie is really important. The next clip that we're going to listen to is from Mitch Resnick. This is from episode 106. When I do it, I invest a lot of my life in my work. 
So I could be someone who people would see could get burned out. I think there are a few ways of trying to avoid it. I do you know, have some other activities. I enjoy running in the morning. I run most mornings. I play tennis with a good friend once a week. So there are other outlets. But maybe even more important, there are a lot of satisfaction I get from when I see the impact that the work is having with young people around the world. Like just yesterday, a close colleague sent me a, an email that they received from someone who was talking about that they visited their brother. They spent time with their nephew and then the 11-year-old nephew who had learned Scratch. And this was a nephew that had lots of challenges, wasn't always successful in you know, sort of the traditional academic channels, but he's really become excited about Scratch and start to see themselves in a new way. And it opened up them seeing themselves and the world in a different way. So when I hear stories like that, that helps prevent the burnout that I just see the meaning that it has in young people's lives. And now here's a clip from episode 108, which is an interview with George Valenzuela. What I do is I loop back the things that I enjoy doing, but that I don't have time to do. And for me, it's hiking, it's sightseeing. One that I do do a lot is eating out. I'm a big foodie, right? Stuff like that. What I do is I make time for those things right now on the weekends, Friday and Saturday, my wife and my two children, we map out something that we want to do in nature. It could be canoeing, it could be sailing, rowboating, whatever, or it could be hiking. And then we find a restaurant, something that we've never tried before. And so we do that like on a Saturday. On a Sunday, it could be a pool day. It could be a game day, a movie day. But the whole point is to do something that you enjoy doing. And that's how you restore your emotional health and your burnout and your fatigue. You have to do something where your mind is no longer engaged in that workflow. And I think if you do that on a consistent basis, like for me, it's the weekends and it's after 930 at night, you know, and at 930 at night might sound funny to you or to someone listening, but I like to watch things that make me laugh, like the Golden Girls. I mean, it's true. The Jeffersons, Martin, shows that I like, humor that I like, and it takes my mind off the workflow. And the thing that I've realized is that it could be the resurrection. Work is going to be there. It's not going away. And so there's nothing wrong in you know, disconnecting for your own mental health. Yeah, that definitely resonates. That's something that I had to learn to do and value. And it wasn't really until a therapist pointed it out, like, hey, you don't, you're not making time for yourself. <laughs> All you're doing is working. <laughs> yeah. And so one thing, like I was in Chicago last week and I did a gig there actually. And my wife said, you've done, I don't know what it's been, man. It's been since April, 2020, I have been basically every week doing PT and you know, it just basically every week. And she said to me, you have not been on a real vacation a long time. So let's take two, three days it's in Chicago. Let's do something fun and no work. And so that was hard for me. It was very hard for me because I have a lot going on. And so like I sat down and I wrote down, so what do I want to do in Chicago? On my bucket list is to visit Michael Jordan's statue. And so we put that on the list. She wanted to do a boat ride on the Riverwalk. She wanted to go to the highest building. I think it was a Sears building. And to look down and see the whole you know, city. And so we did that for three full days in a lot of restaurants. And I realized that I need something like this two, three times a year. You know, not for an entire week or two weeks, maybe five, six days if, if I can afford it or if I have time. But yeah, like you need something like that, or you can't really restore or heal emotionally or you know, mentally from all that's going on. Yeah, that definitely resonates. I house sat from my parents like for a week, maybe a month ago, and just getting out of the summer heat in Phoenix and being able to get up into the forest area because like their backyard backs up to the forest. Like it was wonderful just to disconnect for that week. Need to do that more. <laughs> yeah, like there's a power in nature. You know, nature has amazing restoring qualities. And so I think you just have to know what you actually need. I think. John Spencer has the four R's, you know, relaxation, restoration. I forgot the other two, but you just have to figure out what do you need for your own healing, whatever that is, you know, physical, mental, spiritual, and make time for that. And if you don't, you will regret it eventually. And the people around you 
will probably not be in your life um, forever if you don't do that. All right, so next up, we have an interview with Ashley Waring, who is a coworker at Boot Up. And this is from episode 110. The community is huge. I mean, staying around people that are passionate about the same thing that you are is huge because then when your passion's kind of like, eh, theirs maybe is the opposite and they can pull you back up again. So I think, you know, having people that share the same jam as you is important. I also think it's huge. Like for me, I love computer science. I also love nature. So like getting away from screens and putting my eyeballs on things that are not made out of metal or <laughs> or plastic and digital. That's been huge for me as far as avoiding burnout. I also feel like trying to find something different or new, fun to investigate. I remember a couple of years ago, I was kind of like, Meh. I mean, I've never been like, no, about computer science, but I was just kind of like, eh, I'm not feeling the huge gung-ho passion that I was feeling. And I discovered a new accessibility tool for students who are visually impaired mm -hmm. to be able to experience colors. And that kind of sparked my interest again, you know, so just finding things that are interesting, but also allowing yourself to take a freaking break. Yeah. Get off Twitter for a month or <laughs> however long, you know, like. I mean, sometimes it's okay to just walk away and that's not an easy thing to come across, especially because I feel like in our society, productivity is, you know, godly almost and rest is revolutionary, you know? And so finding that balance, I think is important. Yeah. I'm still working on that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a process. <laughs> All right. So next up is episode 112. And this is an interview with Kalia Braswell. Honestly, the fact that PhD school, <laughs> the fact that grad school is, there's a lot of flexibility in it has worked in my favor, but each semester I have to figure out like what works for me. It literally changes each semester. So semesters where I have two courses and then I'm doing research, those are much lighter and I feel like I can breathe. But then the semesters where I have three courses, that's when it gets really crazy. I really had to start saying no to stuff. Like I was already saying no, but I had to like double down on no. Yep. The pandemic helped and hurt me, I think. Like I feel like I missed out on those experiences where you can go to conferences and meet new people, learn new things because I don't know about you, but I got conference burnout really quickly. So it was like, I don't even want to go to the conference if it's virtual anymore. Again, I mentioned SIGSI, right? And how before PhD, I was able to meet so many people and learn. Like I literally used to leave conferences like with all of these ideas. Well, now I'm siloed because I'm at home, you know, hit or miss with going to the virtual conferences. So that was a miss. But on the plus side, like my classes at Temple, for whatever reason, are from 5.30 until 8 p.m. Every single class. There's no option for a daytime class in either of my programs. I think Temple designed it that way for folks who work. And so imagine trying to like be a responsible human and wake up at 7 or 8 a.m., get your day started. But then at 5.30, when you're ready to like wind down, you actually have to be on Zoom and be alert or be in class and be alert until 8 p.m. So when I first got to Temple, <laughs> I literally like I was I'm not a morning person, but at that time in that season of my life, I was a morning person. I would get up and I would go work out. So I was on campus by nine. And I had worked out, showered, eaten breakfast by nine. And then by eight, I'm like, oh, man, this is tough. So then by Friday, I'm like, oh, man, I have no energy to give to anybody. And so it's been trial and error for me. But and I was like this before, but I don't have email apps on my phone anymore. That's actually new for me. But I previously didn't have notifications. So that helps with the burnout because I'm not constantly like worried about emails. I don't check my email until after I've had breakfast and my tea for the day and maybe even worked out. So I might not get to my email until 10 or 11 a.m. That has been helpful because I realized when I was checking email, it would kind of ruin my morning if I'm like trying to respond to something that I wasn't anticipating and I'm not in the headspace. Therapy has been helpful because my therapist kind of calls me out whenever I slack away from these practices. Got to make sure I work out. So it costs a lot of money, but I bought a Peloton bike. I proved to myself that I would use it first though. I got a cheaper bike. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, I'm going to take the plunge. I got to get the bike. And so I, you know, try to like reach out to folks and say, hey, can you do this ride? And like I wrote before our conversation today, I was like, okay, I have to get this in now or it's not going to happen. And it's an unlearning experience, but I'm trying to get much better at resting and truly resting and 
I don't know when it was. It might have been last year where I realized sleep and resting are two separate things. I think people miss that because I was like, man, I need to get some rest. And they're like, oh, you're not sleeping well. And I was like, "Mm, that's not what I said. (laughs) I was like, no, I sleep great. You know, resting means that I am not thinking about anything. Like, you know, like I'm like laying on the couch watching TV, like just kind of being aimless with my body and my brain literally to rest. And I think a lot of people like me who are overachievers feel guilty when you're resting. It's like, oh, I should be doing something. I have let that go. (laughs) That's nice. It's hard though, because of the systems that exist around us, like capitalism being one, you know, you feel feel like you should be producing and, and putting out output. But I even think that mentality helped me step away from Intech because I started this organization, you know, ego would keep me here, but like I've worn a lot of hats and I've burned out and I know what that feels like and I don't like it. And so I'm in a place in my life where I'm like, even working with my therapist, actually, what does 80% Kalia look like? Because I give 150 to everything just by default and it's killing me. So like, what does 80% look like? What does it look like if I do one thing? So at the top of the year, I'll just be a PhD student. And I'm excited about it. So. Yeah, there's so much good advice in there. I like your idea of like kind of viewing like the semester almost as like a season, like, oh, well, this is a, a lighter season or a heavier season in terms of like load and whatnot. But also just keeping the apps off the phone, like I don't get notifications and like that makes it easier. I try and avoid email until like 10 or 11 o'clock and like then I'll check it one more time at the end of the day, like before I'm done, before I start to rest for the day. And yeah. Because you literally can feel your anxiety. Oh, yeah. Like going up when you're like checking this stuff yep. in a time where you shouldn't be. I don't even sleep with my phone in my bedroom anymore. I charge it in the kitchen or on my desk. And when I'm ready for bed, I walk away from it and I'll figure it out in the morning. And my family hates that, though. <laughs> like, what if something happens? I'm like, well, call the police. Don't call me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I and your comments about rest, like. I engage in a process called Pomodoro. So like the way I do it is like 50 minutes of work and then a 10 minute break. So like an hour chunks. But what I realized, because I'm also very much like I need to be working and progressing or evolving and whatever, like those 10 minute breaks were like, oh, I'm going to practice drums for 10 minutes or, oh, I'm going to work on this thing and improve this thing for 10 minutes, but it's not work. And then I realized, no, I need to just take those 10 minutes and just do some yoga, like, and do that throughout the day and just shut my brain down because it's better for me to rest. (laughs) And the next clip is from episode 114. This is with James Fester. There are a couple of ones that I think are really important. And I think that whether or not you're, if you're a teacher in the classroom, that's a really tough reality. You're a teacher who is teaching remotely from home. That's also brings its own difficulties as well. And so, and a lot of what I'm going to share, I'm pretty sure I've other people would share as well. But one thing that I would definitely say is this is something that I hear all the time from the mental health provider that I work with, which has been great, is making sure that you're taking time for yourself. And that means after a certain, and it's so hard to do, totally get it. I totally understand in a world where we are like connected by the hip to devices where people expect instantaneous replies or, or you have a certain amount of hours to get back to me before X, Y, and Z. Yep. It can be very difficult, but I think it's important to draw some lines. One thing that's really important for me is I work from home. So literally, I never leave my working environment. And that can be really, really difficult sometimes. Oh, somebody just emailed me. I could just sneak into the other room really quickly, even though it's dinner time and I really should be present for my family. It's never going to end unless you draw a line. And you're the only one that can hold that line. And so that's the first thing I would say is you got to set aside time for what's good for you or what you need to do. If it's family that expect you to be present after a day work, great. If it's that you just really need time to decompress, read a book, play a video game, you know, go on a hike and outside, whatever it is, you need to make sure you're doing that because eventually if you don't, it will impact the work that you do. And it won't matter how much time you spend doing the work, you will get worse and worse and the quality will go down. We know that. It's the same thing that I would say to students too. Go home and get a good night's sleep. Don't watch Netflix until 2 a.m. because you're going to come in tired and you will not have actually given your body what it needs. The other thing that I would say strategy wise, and it's I kind of talked a little bit more about it, but I watched this. It was a great TED talk recently. It was a TED talk that was given by a soccer referee. <laughs> And he gave this really great TED talk where he talked about a very simple way to kind of de-stress and detach yourself. Who better than a soccer referee to teach us how not to take things personally or how to not be affected by outside stressors, right? Like it seemed like the perfect way. And so what he said was that he 
basically says to himself, when somebody comes at him hot, when he encounters a situation that's very stressful, when he feels himself getting really amped up or sad or whatever it is, the first question I have to ask is, is this really about me? Is it something else that's affecting you? Is it something else going on? Is it really something that I have done? Or am I just kind of inserting myself into your stress and assuming that I am the reason? That can be really bad. Then the second thing he says is if he can't figure that out, he says, well, maybe this is about me, meaning maybe he is internalizing it. He is interpreting it as now I've done something wrong. It's both sides of the coin where he first has to figure out, is this person coming at me because of their thing? Or am I feeling like this person is coming at me because of my thing? It was really kind of awesome that it seems really simplistic, but I really came away thinking to myself, like, this is really a great thinking tool that I should be using every single time I'm feeling amped up about something. Is this about some person's issues or am I putting this on myself and it has nothing to do with me? Yeah, I like that. I'll definitely include a link to it. And the first part that you had said of like the value in disconnecting and like not getting notifications and whatnot, I imagine that there might be some CS educators like, yeah, but I'm in CS education. It's really hard to do that. We have to be connected, blah, blah, blah. I recommend they check out works by like Cal Newport. So like Deep Work, he also had a book called Digital Minimalism, and then a more recent book called World Without Email. He is a CS professor, I believe, at Georgetown University, and he's constantly preaching like, hey, you don't need social media. Hey, you don't need phone notifications. You don't need to check your email like every 10 minutes, etc. So people can go there to dive a little bit deeper into that. Sounds like an awesome resource. All right, so next up, we're going to hear from Arya Chernik. This is from episode 116. I actually find great beauty and energy in that idea of becoming. It's funny because I actually had a professor in grad school and when we were talking about Derrida, he said there are two kinds of people in the world, you know, those for whom deconstruction kind of instills great anxiety and those for whom it kind of inspires excitement, great deep passion and excitement. And yes, it's extremely difficult. And, you know, logistically, it's difficult. And it's difficult in terms of kind of scaffolding learning. But when I see what students create, and when I hear what students say and reflections about their learning and what they will carry forward with them, that is deeply energizing to me. Those are my happiest moments as an educator. So in terms of kind of maintaining health and well-being, certainly digging into those moments and those feelings. My mom used to say, this is a long time ago. One time I called her, I used to have a long drive from teaching. And so I would often call her from the car. And one day we were talking and I was tired. And she said, you know, even when you're tired, even after you've had a long day, you always sound so happy after you teach. And like that stayed with me all these years because I am, I'm happy when I teach. And then there's running and reading, finding a book that I can't wait to get back to at the end of the evening. That's hugely restorative for me being at the ocean. So there are certainly things that I do to try to maintain balance. And next is a clip from episode 120. This is with Monica McGill. Well, for me personally, because I had just left academia. So for me doing the research and the teaching in my mind, being more focused on the research, I feel like, and some academics may understand this, but I left academia, right? Because I was working all the time. Interestingly enough, I was in a meeting this weekend, a virtual meeting, and there were physicians in the meeting. And one physician was like, was explaining how someone on else works. And he said that this person works like an academic because they're working all weekend. We're getting emails on the weekend. We're getting emails in the evening and there's just no stopping. And, you know, they wanted to care for this person to make sure that this person was taking time off and, and recouping and restoring themselves. So for me, leaving academia has been good for me personally, and it's allowing me the opportunity to do research. And I'm trying very hard to to have times that I work and times that I don't work. And if I do work odd hours, I'm, you know, scheduling messages. So they go out at normal work time. So somebody else doesn't have to feel like they have to respond at eight o'clock at night or on the weekend. There's a lot to do. And I try to focus on this 
aspect that we're just one tiny spoke in a wheel, a very, very, very huge wheel. And, you know, if I can help other people on that same wheel, do the work that they're trying to do and make that high quality, then, you know, hopefully it's about sharing the opportunity to make things better for this next generation that's coming up. Yeah, I appreciate that answer. Having gone to school with and been the kind of person who never stops working, like I have learned the value of setting aside time to rest and that I had to learn the hard way. So for anyone else who is also that kind of individual, I do recommend taking a break. (laughs) Like even if it's like at 5 p.m., I set an alarm and that's when I just shut my brain down from working on this thing and focus on family or whatever. It makes life a lot better. Yeah, exactly. So we've also taken up hiking during the pandemic. One of the ways that we've been trying to, my husband and I have been trying to get exercise while also not being able to go to the gym anymore is or not going to the gym. I guess it is open now, but just to go out and enjoy nature and go hiking, take the dogs, all that good stuff. Yeah. Being in Phoenix, we actually have quite a Bit of hiking opportunities around it's it's pretty nice so if anyone has mountains nearby or hills i highly recommend hiking as well <laughs> yeah definitely and next we have a conversation with sarah lev this is from episode 122 and we actually talk about a whole lot more like meditation and yoga as well as general mindfulness and wellness so make sure you check out the rest of the episode for even more well it was really about like having my own designated space for my classroom, which was like, basically I have a small house. So I just in the hallway at a desk, closing my laptop and like getting outside. I would go outside for lunches. I would take my son on bike rides during the lunch, trying to do something different to sort of make that space different for myself. You know, I, I saw a funny video that was like somebody like they're sitting on their couch, end of the work day, they close their laptop and they move over a foot and then they open their laptop and they're like, it's the weekend, you know? <laughs> so, it's, But it's kind of like that. It's kind of like having a designated space, I think, to help. But also, like I was saying, my mornings of listening to a positive podcast, doing the dishes, exercising outside, like all of those things to mark beginning of work, pre-work and then post-work. I also am lucky I live in Los Angeles. We live near the ocean. We can drive to the beach and see the beach. And that was really, really helpful. Being outside really helps me. Yeah. Your joke about moving over a foot like that, (laughs) it actually sounds like one of the things that I did to separate my like work time from my leisure time on the same device. Like, so right now I have a monitor directly in front of me and then one angled to my right. But what I would do when I was switching to leisure is I would change that orientation. So now it's on the left of that angle monitor. <laughs> and like that little thing, it made a huge difference. It was like, okay, no, I'm in leisure time. I'm not in work time right now, even though it's all the same hardware I'm using. <laughs> yeah, that's great. The other thing I think I'd heard, you know, I would always like get dressed and like put shoes on, right? Like I think something I heard that not everybody did, right? Like I would get dressed as if I was going to work. And then after work, it would be like, okay, my shoes are off and now I'm you know, in my sweats or whatever. So I think I didn't thought about that, but I think that was another thing that I did that helped me feel like I was working and not working. Next up we have from episode 124, an interview with Kimberly Scott. You know, it's funny. And I read your question, like, you know, what do you do in order to avoid burnout? At first I was like, oh, does he want me to talk about, you know, working out? Or, you know, does it... But then to me, that's what so many of us do, you know, to try to balance ourselves. I mean, I have, I think, pretty interesting pastimes, but at least most people say like I do aerial yoga. My wife does. Yeah, we have an aerial yoga rig like literally underneath me. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. I know whose house I'm visiting. (laughs) Oh, I love aerial yoga because, you know, it engages my body in ways that is a different rhythm than my normal sitting in a chair and being in a meeting. But I think along the same lines, I think about how to engage my mind and my spirit and I return to art. So I've become also one of my big hobbies, at least now is photography. And you think about it, you know, photography, there is a lot of computational thinking. And so some of my side gigs are photo shoots. So I'm going on a photo shoot tomorrow to do wild horses. My professional life still bleeds into that because I'm conscious about not so much the horses, but when I'm photographing people, who's in the shot? How are we representing their being? You know, let me engage them in the process. So is this really the story you want told in this way? Here are my ideas. 
but Lord knows my ideas may not be congruent to what you want. So that's the only thing I wanted to say because I was chuckling when I was thinking about how to address that, but I think it still reflects my professional self, even though it's a different rhythm. And the following clip is from episode 127 with Sarah Vogel. Every time I think I've balanced or I've reached kind of like optimal boundary setting, something changes that resets and then I have to go back and do it again. So I started this new job at Bank Street, which has been exhilarating and really exciting, but also really challenging. Anytime you teach something new for the first time, just getting your head around the course, the content, the curriculum, like the directions that you're going, it's overwhelming. So it's, it's like, wait, how am I living my first year teaching again? But I'm not living my first year teaching again. I think I have many more boundaries from that time. But now I do actually have a separate space. I'm lucky in not having the situation that you mentioned, like, I can come to an office, I can work here, and then I can go home and sort of make a mental separation between those two locations can help. And then just knowing like, I try to plan activities and things that are outside so that I purposely give myself a time to quit. And, you know, those help having people, accountability partners, like, you know, in my family or my boyfriend to say, did you eat today? Like kind of those reminders of like, you're in this grind, but you're not too firmly in it. And it's really tough. But I think it's also that feeling of like, I will come out the other side of this year and then hopefully come away with even more strategies for that balance in the next year when things are a little bit more stable. At the next clip is from episode 129 with Addison Lilholt. Luckily, very luckily, the content that I focus on in my classroom, it's continually changing because of what CS is, things like AI and machine learning. When I'm covering that, I was covering this a few years ago. It's different now. And I've expanded that unit to include things like unintended bias in artificial intelligence and talking about Hmm. why, why does that exist? And I have the students create their own biased models by accident and then show them how, why they did that and then fix it. And they all fix it immediately. Like they know exactly how to do it. They get somebody else in, take a new picture. And what I think keeps me from burning out is seeing those moments of like, whoa, aha moments beyond like, aha. But I also really like the stuff that I teach. I'm really, they always say like, oh, passionate teacher. I just find the content that I cover to be fun. It's fun for me to do. And same with music. I love playing music and I have fun playing music. I might be able to teach it, to be honest, but I wouldn't keep doing it in my off time if I didn't truly enjoy the stuff that I do in the classroom. So I think that keeps me from burning out. I'm lucky. There's no doubt about it. I'm very lucky to be able to say that. And the next clip is from episode 131. This is from Ruth Farmer. It's really hard. I mean, the burnout is real. One thing though, is I just get so much energy from seeing the successes of the students and seeing the notes come back to us. And, you know, we recently helped one of our grantees. We had given her a grant to help her finish college. She graduated. And then we helped her negotiate her first job offer because low-income students can't turn to their parent or their family member and say like, is this a good offer at Microsoft or Amazon? And so we helped the student negotiate her starting salary from $75,000 to $104,000. Nice. She is going to make roughly $400,000 more over the next decade than she would have. And it's like life-changing for her to start at that level. And it positions her as having a high value because if you get paid less in your first job than your peers, you're perceived to be worth less because you cost less. And so negotiating that first job is one of the most important things you can do in how you launch into the field. So those types of wins, you know, are happening pretty frequently for us these days. So our model is we're going to invest in these students. They're going to graduate and they're going to get great jobs and they're going to come back as a volunteer and ultimately as an investor later. We had our first student come back to reinvest in the fund 10 months after we started. We funded her in February of 2020. She graduated in June. She came back and invested in August and continues to support us. And so it's like this virtuous circle, we call it, you know, investment, engagement, reinvestment that is going to power this long term. And Yeah, I'm really excited about that piece of the model because we have these alumni relationships with the students. So we find out like, where are you working? And we congratulate them when they graduate and they come back and support other students like them. Next up, we have a clip from 
an interview with Maya Israel. This is from episode 133. I'll start by saying I feel like this is privileged work to be able to work in academia and ask the questions that I think are really important and engage with folks who also find those questions important to me. It just feels like a privilege to get to do this kind of work. At the same time, like you said, it's a whole lot of privileged work. (laughs) So it's a lot of work. And so I feel like you have to protect your time and you have to say no sometimes, which is difficult to do, especially in education when you're committed to systems change and students with disabilities. And so I don't know that I have a great answer for it, except for that I try to balance and I don't always do a very good job of it. But, you know, there are a few things I'm learning from my colleagues, like I try really hard to not have meetings on Wednesdays, even though we're speaking on a Wednesday. You know, I was able to spend this morning just doing work and not having a ton of meetings. And so I was able to actually like sit in the work. And sometimes what ends up happening is that we're so busy that we don't actually get to do the work or just running from meeting to meeting. And so carving out those times and protecting those times is really important. At the same time, also recognizing that there is life outside of work is also really important. And so what I try to do is, you know, make sure that my entire identity isn't tied to being a researcher faculty member. So Mm. I read a lot of fiction, things that have nothing to do with computer science. Yep. I, you know, I try to get outside, you know, all of those things that we know we have to do to kind of maintain that balance. It depends on the day and the week, how well I do with it. Yeah. I also have like a deep work practice in that I try and schedule about two hours at the start of the day before I have meetings, before I check email, where I'm just engaged and work on something, whatever it is, that's like a big upcoming project. And that has been very helpful. The idea of like having an identity outside of work is something that I've had to work through with a therapist, like to try and reconcile that. And like now I'm like sharing my music and video game identities much more publicly. And I've never done that before. And that is like part of a process for me for like reconciling all these identities and just being more open and be like, hey, I don't just do computer science. I also do these other things. And they're a part of what makes me who I am. Yeah, there's like an entire space on Instagram that is filled with people who are bookish people. And so... It's like an amazing thing to connect with people on something that has nothing to do with computer science. And it's like completely nerdy bookish conversations where you're like, I just read this amazing book. Who else has read it? And they're like, this is great. And what a gorgeous book cover. And so I think it's really healthy to do that. And it's also good to model that for our students too, who are coming in and they're, you know, part of the grind and they're trying to get through their qualifying exams and to publish all the papers and to get their CVs ready so that they can be competitive. And so it's really important to recognize that that's not the only part of your life. When you look back on your life, nobody says, I don't think, I wish I'd worked more, Hmm. right? So the work's important. The work is privileged, but it's not the only thing that makes up your life. Yeah, my first therapist had experience working in hospice. And that was one of the things that she had said to me. And it did not really connect with me when I heard it at the time. This was during undergrad and when I was like really getting started with career, etc. And I was so driven. But now I'm like, oh, I get what she was saying many years ago. (laughs) Yeah. And those people are amazing folks who do that work. Talk about difficult but necessary and absolutely critical work for people and their families. So yeah, I could see they definitely need to disengage from that because it's the emotional toll of that is something. Next up, we have a clip from Bob Irving. This is from episode 135. That's interesting, you know, because I guess to go back to what we were talking about before, it's not just our students who've gone through this global pandemic and are, you know, carrying the scars, but those of us who I think society realized are frontline workers now. I mean, a lot of people, and I'm sure you've talked to them, they're scarred. They've been caught between, you know, all these conflicting demands and political and, you know, whatever, you know, expectations and health fears and all that kind of stuff. So I'll tell you one thing that I don't think is really that helpful is to provide wellness programs at your school. And I've seen a lot of that. We're just going to teach you to do mindfulness. And I'm a big believer in meditation and mindfulness. 
big believer in it. But I don't think that's the way you handle people who are experiencing this kind of burnout. I really don't. Yeah. I don't know what the answer is. But again, it's a systemic thing where we have you know the factories already set up. We're trying to jam people through this. It's so inhumane in a way. The whole system is inhumane. I mean, fortunately, it's staffed with people like you and me that are going into teaching. We're not doing it to get rich. We're doing it because we love learning and we love, we like kids and we want to make the world a better place, right? That's really tricky. And especially in our field, in the CS field, how are you going to attract teachers when they're not going to get two or three times what they would get paid teaching, plus have all of these other you know, duties and responsibilities and expectations? I don't know. I think it you know, requires systemic reform. I don't know how that's going to happen, I'll be honest. Are there any other approaches or tools like meditation that you use to help yourself? <laughs> yeah, there is. <laughs> Music. Now, that's me. That's my personal thing, but I always tell people I have a musical alter ego. His name is Chicago Bob, and he plays blues guitar. You know, this is my passion musically, is learning about this kind of music and learning to play it. So during the pandemic, I actually set up a weekly Facebook live event where I played music half an hour. I called it the Southern Comfort Sessions or, you know, I said, to make of it what you will. But it was a way for me to express that and connect with people. I mean, it's a personal note. It was amazing for me because I was able to keep in touch with family and friends, former students even, and, you know, friends that I hadn't seen in decades, you know, and we were able to connect through this, you know, live music in the midst of this craziness that we're all experiencing. And I, you know, I told somebody the other day, to me, that's like oxygen. Can a school facilitate it for their teachers to follow passions? Didn't Google used to have their 25%? You spent a quarter of your time just following something that you're really jazzed about. Now we're talking crazy, I'm sure. But I mean, if you really want to see people make it and people are leaving the profession, in droves. Yeah. They are burning out. And this next clip is from episode 139. This is with Mike Cackley. For me, it's just trying to balance, I guess. We know, as I said earlier, adult SEL has come before you can teach it to students. And so one of the things I did this year, the first time I've taught somewhere close by where I live, not a half hour drive. And so I bought a bike and I'm riding my bike to school every day. And that alone makes sure I exercise because once I sit on the couch at home, I'm highly unlikely to get up. But I found every morning, like that physical activity gets me going, gets me ready for the day. And then on the way home, I have that stress for the day. I just kind of release it in my bike ride. And so that's been a huge savior for me this year. If it wasn't for my bike ride, I think I would lose my mind. Yeah, I like that idea. I have also been trying to do that where I will do like strength-based workout in the morning before I start my day and then to kind of close off my day and use it as a signal of saying, hey, you're done working on this thing. I'll do some kind of cardio in the afternoon. And that has been nice having those like start and end points for me. It's so important because it's so easy to neglect it. And then lots of bad habits for me, eating habits, all those things. Next up from episode 142 is Charlotte Dungan. It's hard if you're at that point right now you might look around and think it's not worth it. And it's okay if it isn't. It's okay to protect yourself, to take care of yourself. I think it's really important to take time and break in the summer to actually recharge and not do every PD offered, every you know summer camp available to you. It's not worth the little bit of money to take on that second job if you can't come back restored and refreshed. I think we need to do a better job as a society in supporting educators and recognizing what enormously hard work that they have been doing over the last several years and how many people are leaving the field, especially really thoughtful, dedicated educators who just can't do it anymore. And we can't continue to ask teachers to give up their planning periods to cover for other teachers. Teaching is the only field I know where you have to bring your own whiteboard markers to the classroom to teach a class. And so unless we fix things systemically, we're not going to see the best educators. You know, they, they may choose to leave because it's too hard. And I don't think that's wrong. But if you want to stay, the best way to do it is to continue to fall in love with your students and your subject 
seek out a great administration. It's okay to go to the district next door and and take care of yourself. Maybe that isn't the answer I was supposed to say, but that's what I feel is true is like, until we as a society take care of educators, we're going to continue to see turnover. Yeah. Are there systems that you put into place to try and help yourself? Like I really appreciate that last point resonates with me. Like I was in a district where it wasn't great. And then I moved to a different district and it was awesome. So like just having a change of admin and environments can have a profound impact on like my own personal well-being and whatnot. Oh, yeah. I do think it's important to continue learning independently. I think in the classroom, though, we can also set the bar a little bit lower. I think formative assessment is really useful as a tool to take the pressure off for you personally as a teacher to have like a quick reflection piece where you can see where they're at, but you don't have to grade every darn thing. Mm. I think using some tools like peer assessment in assessment of projects and having like really clear rubrics that students can self-evaluate and having like clear endpoints where a project is showcased, for example. And if you meet all the requirements of the showcase, well, then you know what your grade is. And taking some of that pressure off yourself, it's also okay to set some really clear boundaries. Like I don't work on Sundays. Mm. I don't grade. I don't, I go mountain biking. That's what I do. And Having those boundaries does not make you a bad teacher, even if it means you didn't finish a certain thing that you were supposed to get done. Hmm. So focusing on what matters. I have the like two by two in my brain of like make four squares important and urgent. And really you only need to do the things that are important and urgent Hmm. and the other things can wait. And that as long as your students are in the important plus urgent bucket, the fact that you graded something or didn't this weekend probably doesn't matter. I really appreciate that response. I have heard similar things in some sessions before and people have said that they felt like they needed the permission to do that. They needed to hear that from somebody. So hopefully there's a listener out there who listened to that and is like, yes, this just resonated really well with them. Try to remain in the work. It's what you're doing is really important. You matter to kids, you know, you're giving them opportunities they might not otherwise have, but you don't have to sacrifice yourself. And the next clip is from episode 144 with Carter Zemke. I think there's always like a new project to tackle with any course. I think there's something you can always do to improve it. And talking with educators, I always know that they're, I want to do this. I want to do that. And I think that's an amazing attitude to have. And I think it's one that sustains people. I've also tried to learn to say no to some things and try to focus some stuff. I'm not going to make that improvement this fall. I'm not going to do this or that. And I'm instead going to focus on this other thing because it more aligns with these values I want the course to have in this case. And that's both freed up some time for me. And I think also allowed me to focus more and make something better when I decide to make a change. The next clip is from episode 146 with Ben Owens. I won't kid anyone listening that this is indeed hard work. What I found was by doing that hard but different work that was more collaborative, more inviting, more inclusive was so much more rewarding that it was worth it. It was worth the time investment. And if I had worked half the number of hours that I did, but was just sort of going through the motions and knowing that it wasn't having the impact, that would have burned me out within the heart. Because what was motivational in this goes back again to, I think, what Daniel Peake talks about is that purpose, mastery, and autonomy. I knew that at my school, there was a clear living mission that provided purpose that was consistent and in alignment with what I wanted to do to make a difference in the world for the time that I'm on this planet. That was my way to channel that and affect it with the students I was working with. I had the ability to master things by knowing that I could collaborate with colleagues, knowing that we could share ideas so that we could constantly get better and continue to become better teachers and master that approach. And then I had the autonomy. That didn't mean that I could just close my door and do my own thing. I had the collective autonomy where, again, our ideas mattered. What I could bring as a passionate educator to my colleagues and they could listen and they could give me feedback was respected. So I could leave at the end of the day, knowing that with that purpose, mastery, and autonomy, I'm doing good work that is in alignment to my core values as a person. And I think that ultimately is, if you are in that place, which I was fortunate enough to be, and I would also say I'm pretty fortunate enough to be, since I run my own nonprofit, I guess I'm my own boss. So I just make sure that ethos exists in this community as well, that you can leave with a smile on your face and knowing that you've done good work. 
that day. Now, I think as you're alluding to, you can also take that to the extreme and become just insane. And my wife would probably argue that I, <laughs> I do that on occasion. It is imperative that you block time. And I've, I've gotten good at practices like just, I'm going to block a day and that's my day. And it's not the weekend. It's my day where I still may be doing work, but it's work that I get to dictate. I get to define. I get to sit down and read or just do something that's totally different. And it's not dictated by a meeting or whatever. And then, you know, I'm also shut down at four o'clock every day. I'm done unless there's a specific thing that others expect me to be in for whatever reason, but I'm pretty stingy about what those can be. That's the time where my wife and I and our dog and cats can, <laughs> can enjoy being together. We can go walk in the woods. Or we, I can go on a run or I can do whatever. So I think it's having that level of discipline to know that, you know, when you're doing work, you're going to go all in, but you're also going to ensure that you protect um, as well so that you're honoring self. And don't treat that as being selfish, but treat that as part of the entire system to stay healthy in all the different ways that are necessary. Yeah, I really appreciate that response. The work that I do literally will never end in terms of like the th series of things that I can always work on. So like having those firm, here's when I start working, here's when I stop working, that definitely helps. Now I say that with full recognition of I started at 5 a.m. this morning because I woke up at 4 and like... It's just like one of those days where, all right, it's definitely going to be like a 10 hour day. But in general, I try and do eight to four, get my eight hours. And <laughs> we all have those days. But <laughs> yeah, I think as long as we do it in moderation, then uh, we're, they're honoring self. And the final clip from episode 149 is with Napia Nabuya. Yeah. Oh, it's a daily task for me. I'm not even going to lie. <laughs> I am having to redefine it every day. Holistically for me is taking care of my mind, body, spirit, and soul every day. So putting my phone on do not disturb at a certain time, right? Making sure that I'm focusing on myself from this time to this time. So my do not disturb hits from 10 p.m. to 10 a.m. So you cannot get in touch with me after 10 p.m. at night or before 10 a.m. the next morning. So, and I could be doing absolutely nothing, <laughs> right? And that, that's just me prioritizing myself and me setting boundaries because social media is addictive, right? I can scroll Instagram for hours, right? That's one of my approaches. Also, you know, just how am I feeding myself throughout the day? So I'm an engineer, I've been an engineer almost seven years and I can easily get overwhelmed. Like I am always super anxious when I'm doing like code changes or I'm on call when we doing escalations. I'm just always really anxious. Like, oh, what if I take this server down or Ooh, what if this, you know, the wrong semicolon here will completely just throw this code. I'm always on edge and I feel like it may never go away. I feel like that paranoia is just a part of being an engineer. So making sure I'm listening to something that's also calming me throughout the day. So I as well listen to podcasts. I'm listening to inspirational music or listening to, you know, an interview of one of my favorite artists or actresses or actors or something like that. And then also being mindful that working from home now that I need to get out of this space at some point in my day. I was working from home prior to the pandemic. So all in all, I've been working from home maybe six years now. So it is a long time. And what I first realized was you work longer hours working from home. So I have friends who are just like, oh, I want to work from home position. And I'm like, it's not all it's cracked out to be. Like, I don't know if anybody else is saying that who works from home, but for me, somebody who likes to be out, likes to be doing things and social being confined to your house and walking 20 feet, <laughs> you know, every day is not like my ideal, you know, life. I had to, you know, get invested in a co-working space. So, you know, if I feel like I need a change of scenery, I can go 10 minutes down the street to a co-working space, go to a coffee shop. But being able to get outside of these four walls, now that I'm confined to these four walls to work is a really big deal for me. So if I do decide to stay home working one day that I'm leaving, I'm going to the gym, I'm, you know, going to run some errands. I don't want to do food delivery one day. I need to get out. I'm one of those people where I thrive from sunlight. 
So I need to make sure that, you know, my body is getting in that vitamin D, you know, every day if possible. So those are just different things I do. And drinking water. I love water. I am not somebody that drinks a lot of juice. I don't drink soda. So keeping myself hydrated, taking vitamins, juicing, smoothies, that is my holistic approach and wellness um, that I also like to tell the girls as well, because if I don't feel well, that translates into my work as well. Yeah. And the connection between just like mind and body, I don't think people realize that and focus on that enough. Like the reason why I work out so much and the reason why I drink smoothies as my breakfast and lunch, it's like vegetables and fruit and whatnot. And the reason why I do that is because it has a profound impact on my mental health. And as somebody who suffers from like chronic depression, I need to make sure I monitor that because otherwise it could spiral out of control. So try and avoid that. <laughs> I know. And I was just having a conversation with a friend and she told me she doesn't take vitamins. And I was like, what? I was like, you need to take, why don't you take vitamins? I feel when I have like, I've ran out of vitamins and I have not started taking, I know exactly when I'm not taking vitamins. Like I feel it immediately. So it's just little things. And I miss the in-person connection, but then I'm also finding how to adapt to this to where I don't feel like I need to be back into an office to thrive as well. So like you said, drinking my smoothies, you know, I was just telling, you know, some friends, we all skate, roller skate, like let's go roller skating at Piedmont Park this weekend, you know, just different things like that. It's my way to decompress and then also a way for me to still enjoy myself and not get tiresome. Because like I said earlier, working from home, you work much longer than what's expected and don't even realize it. Right. Do you have advice for people who might find it difficult to kind of separate their leisure space from their workspace? Like if they're in a small like studio or one bedroom apartment and like their office is like literally in their living room, basically. That was me. I just bought a house last year. And prior to that, I was in a 750 square foot one bedroom apartment. Outside of my bedroom was my kitchen, living room, office, workout room, all in, in one space. And I knew then when I started working from home, I was just like, yeah, mm, I need more space. Advice, take breaks. If you can't do like a long extended period of time, just take like 10, 15 minutes. I made a point, I think back to when I was in my apartment, I would set times where I would go check my mailbox. You know, even if all of my bills are e-bills, right? I get everything to my email, but just walking down to my mailbox and then going to see the leasing agent, you know, we, me and her were really good friends. So just going to talk to her. I used to live in an area where we had lots of trails. And the trails were so long. So just going and walking 10 minutes down the trail and coming back. But just setting and planning out your day worked for me. And I have to give all the credit to my friend, Karen, rest in peace. Karen definitely was a avid planner. I have never met somebody who had so many planners and notebooks and stationery. And before she passed away, I said, sis, we really need to get your stationery business up and going because she would always send me links like you need this planner. I love this planner. And I just felt like and it's still not organized, but I felt my life was a little bit organized, a little better. And I found myself being able to keep myself accountable. You know, when I saw something written down versus, oh, shoot, I forgot to take that two minute walk today, or I forgot to go to the mailbox. I see it written down. So I know, okay, I need to stick to this because it's physically written and I can see it. So I'm holding myself more accountable for it. Yeah, time blocking and planning and whatnot has definitely helped me out. My first therapist that I went to helped me go through that process. And it made me realize, oh, I literally don't have a single moment to myself. Like this is like during my undergrad when it was like, I start teaching at like 7am and then I go until class until like 7 or 8pm at night and there's like no breaks in between. So Oh, no, no. I definitely learned the hard way where I would start working at nine. And then next thing you know, I look at the window and the sun is setting. It's 7 30, 8 o'clock, and I haven't took lunch. Yep. I got a whole bunch of snacks at my desk. I gained a whole bunch of weight from there. And I was just like, yeah, no, can't do this. Yeah. It's like a gift and a curse. It's great that able to sit and focus for that extended period of time because I'm able to do that as well. But it's also 
so detrimental to your health when you don't take those breaks. Like when I was painting the house many years ago when we got it, like I literally just like didn't even think about food and forgot about it and was like, oh, wow, I've been painting for like 15 hours today. I need to stop and like actually take a break and probably open up windows. <laughs> it was all trial and error for me. Was it things that I tried that didn't work? Absolutely. The committing to going to the gym every day was the hardest thing that I ever put down in my planner. So I had to start setting realistic goals. And then once I set those realistic goals, then pushed a little further past that. So instead of saying, I'm going to go to the gym, you know, every day this week, I was just like, I'm going to go to the gym for 15 minutes. Let me set like a mini expectation, you know, just to see if I meet that. Okay. I did 15 minutes. Okay. Now I'm going to work out for 30 minutes on Thursday. So being able to set small milestones for yourself. And I think it's the same way with any goal we set in life. It's great. You know, we have this big picture, but how I goal set is just like, okay, I know I want to, you know, get my PhD, but what are the steps I need to do to get there first before I ultimately reach that goal? I need to make sure I have work-life balance. If I don't have work-life balance now, I'm damn sure not going to have it, <laughs> you know, pursuing a PhD. That's just how my mind operates. Like I see the end goal, but I know there's obstacles in between that I need to deal with first before I get to that. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, work-life balance is definitely something to get a hold of before you start PhD. <laughs> Here, hence why I have not gotten it yet. <laughs> And with that, that concludes the supercut from this prior year of guests responding to the question about how to prevent burnout. There are two more episodes just like this that compile all the clips from other guests in the first 100 episodes. And I do include a link to that in the show notes at jaredoleary.com. So make sure you check that out if you haven't listened to those episodes. This field is difficult. I hope this helps you out. And I hope you consider sharing with other educators in the field. So that way we can learn some strategies about how to prevent burnout. Stay tuned next week for another episode. Until then, I hope you're all staying safe and are having a wonderful week.